Welcome to, uh, this is History 3394. I'm calling it Radical Moments in U.S. History. The reason I'm calling it Moments rather than Movements um, is that this is the first time I've kind of devised this class, and it's only a three-week mini-semester, so I figure we're not going to have enough time to talk about movements per se, so we'll talk about certain things which I'll call Moments. I'm trying to be clever here. Um, I'm hoping that based on what we do in this semester, I'm going to be able to turn this into a regular 15-week class. So this is kind of like I'm doing on spec. So it could turn out to be like a mid-season replacement at Fox, you know, and get canned after a week. But we'll hope it, it actually gets a long run and it ends up like, you know, The Simpsons going for 20 years or something like that. Um, we'll go over this very briefly in a minute and then we'll start talking. Let me just kind of tell you a little bit about what I plan to do with this. Um, it's a history of radicalism and protests in the U.S., but it's kind of narrowly defined. I was originally going to call it something like from the Tea Party to the Tea Party, but I don't want to, I mean, we can talk about the modern day group called the Tea Party, but those aren't the kind of people I'll probably be, I know they're not the kind of people I'll be focusing on. When I talk about radicalism and protests, I'm going to be talking about essentially people's movements, anti-state movements, movements based on economics, things like that. Movements of people against power. And the reason the, the book you're reading, the textbook, which I wrote, is called American Power, American People, is specifically for that reason. That's a dynamic that interests me. Uh, the idea that we have this group in, in power, who I'll probably refer to as the ruling class quite a bit, and then you have the people. And to see how they interact is really kind of the core of what we're trying to do here. This is also a really good time to be taking this because what's going on right now since September in the United States all over? What's like the biggest story in the past three months in the United States? Occupy, Occupy movements all over Occupy Wall Street and elsewhere, right? So what you're seeing today is a, is a manifestation of exactly what we're going to be talking about. And in fact, we're going to have people coming in tomorrow. Um, we're going to have a couple speakers come in, um, one of whom does a lot of environmental work all over the country, another one who's local, and she's very active in Occupy Houston. And she also ran for city council this year, kind of as an insurgent candidate. So we're going to try to make these connections too. Um, so it's going to be kind of narrowly defined. We're going to be talking about these anti-state movements, people's movements, political movements. Uh, we're not going to be talking about groups like the Tea Party, the current Tea Party, the right-wing Tea Party. Um, and um, we'll, we'll do, like today I'm going to do a lot of like 18th, 19th century stuff so we can get up, because I know you'd rather be talking about more contemporary uh, movements and, and periods like the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam Movement, and we'll go all the way up to Occupy Wall Street, all right? Um, there's only two books, because again, it's a short class. Uh, the uh, textbook, American Power, American People, which picks up in 1877, and that's just for an overview, to kind of give you context about what we're talking about. And then uh, Bruce Watson's book, Red and Roses, which is really cool, I don't know if anybody's read it yet, but it's an account of a very famous strike uh, in, in uh, uh, 1912. Uh, and um, make sure you read that. In terms of testing, uh, what I'll do is I'm not going to do anything this week because Christmas is coming up. Uh, the week back, I'll give you kind of some kind of a take-home assignment, which will be test one. And then for the final, we'll, we'll figure that out. It'll probably be something similar. So it'll be kind of a writing assignment. And it'll be kind of like two writing assignments will be your, your grade in here. In addition to talking, I, I really do want you to kind of pipe up during class and um, contribute to it. Um, I'll also have some readings on here. Like I said, this is a preliminary syllabus. I'm still working on it because you know, class has just ended last week and I've had um, other stuff going on and my computer upstairs was down for a couple days too. Um, but, but there'll be more articles on this as well. All right. Um, so we'll meet on Mondays and Tuesdays, actually meet. I may have some optional meetings if I can get some speakers in or if we're lagging. But um, the first, and, and the, the second week when we come back, it's actually going to be Tuesday and Wednesday because there's no class. Uh, school's still closed on January 2nd, which is that Monday. So this week we'll meet today and tomorrow, and then maybe an optional meeting if Kennedy are up for it, because tomorrow we're going to lose class time because we have speakers coming in, which is fine. Uh, and then when we come back, it'll be the third and the fourth, which is Wednesday and Thursday. I'm sorry, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then the third week, it'll be that Monday and Tuesday again. All right? So anybody have any questions on this stuff? Uh, what I want to start doing then is just kind of give a general well overview of, of kind of what I mean by radical history and, and where we're starting, where we're beginning. Um, in the United States, we tend to kind of see things as, as occurring kind of in this linear pattern. We started at this particular point, and, you know, we had slaves, and uh, women weren't allowed to vote, and Indians were treated badly, and we kind of moved forward. Okay, so there's this linear pattern, 
And in general, um, and you see this in the political debate, there's recently been a huge debate uh, uh, with like the Republicans attacking Obama back and forth on, on American exceptionalism. Anybody ever, what, anybody ever heard that phrase, what's American exceptionalism? Exceptional it's different. Than, it's kind of, it's immune from the laws that govern everybody else, right? This is exceptional. We do things differently. Now, so other countries, how do they evolve? How do they develop socially in other countries? What kind of things happen? Not here, of course, but other places. I mean, again, what's been happening all year, 2011, in the Middle East, you, know, you have revolutions, you have these oppressions, you have the state oppressing people, all right? In, in, the, in the narrative that we know, that we're taught for the most part, um, and especially the one that you get in the media from Fox News and CNN and the Houston Chronicle and, and the New York Times and everybody else, that's kind of, the U.S. has kind of been immune to that. We, we don't have that history. The United States things have just kind of happened in this linear fashion. We had problems, but we had phrased, we faced them, we confronted them, we overcame them, and, and everything's fine now. Um, within that is lost this whole idea of struggle you know, and, and what people have done to challenge the power of those folks who were in charge. Even when we, I mean, you know, at times we hear about it. Probably the best known example would be like the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Everybody's aware of that. Everybody's aware of that. Everybody knows Martin Luther King's, right? So we know that there was this struggle. And it's presented as this moral issue, right? These, these people standing up to this really horribly uh, immoral system of, of apartheid, of segregation in the United States. Um, but there's so much more to, to the civil rights movement even that, but there's so much more to this whole idea of struggle than that. This kind of stuff's been going on forever in the United States. The U.S. has a history of protest, a history of radicalism, a history of violent repression, a history of violent uprisings that we're not really told about, that isn't in the kind of typical narrative that you hear about U.S. history. So, you know, when I teach a survey class the first day, I generally tell students, you've been lied to most of your life, if not your whole life, and so I'm not suggesting, you know, that I'm telling the truth, although of course I am, but uh, um, you're going to hear something different for, for a little while here. And so what I want to do is focus on this kind of, this idea of struggle and resistance and protest and talk about how people stood up to particular things. And there's a long history of this. The, the, the area that most interests me in this is the idea of class protest, because I think that's another thing that, that only recently Americans are talking about. And that's the one thing the Occupy movement is very striking, is that for the first time really since I was real, real, real young, many, 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 many generations ago, um, people are talking about class and capitalism. And, and that's important because most radical movements or radical moments or most protest movements at some point, at some root base are, are, are kind of the condition by these economic conditions. That's clearly the case today. I mean, the whole Wall Street movement, the globalization movement of the 90s was based on that, right? So we're going we're gonna to do... A lot of that, and I just, you know, at, at any time, please talk. I mean, this is two and a half hours. I don't want to stand up here and listen to myself <clears throat> for that long, so please ask questions and, and talk, all right? All right, anybody have anything to start? All right, you kind of know how the United States got started, right? Um, settlers from uh, England come over. They get charters. Uh, the main purpose for most of them to come over was commercial. They come over to make money. Uh, in the first instance. So the first group of settlers or charters, they come over, they assume that they can um, get Indians to work for them, to do their labor. Uh, they assume that there are all these wealth, this wealth and riches that you can trade. I mean, people go to Virginia assuming that they're gonna find citrus fruit and create a wine crop that will rival France's and things like that. None of that happens. So what they do find, especially in Virginia, is that there are certain uh, uh, agricultural commodities that will work particularly well in North American soil. Foremost, of course, is tobacco, which is still around. The problem with tobacco, if you're a planter, if you own one of these big plantations, it requires a lot of labor. And so the first labor force in the U.S. comes over to work in the tobacco farms in places like Virginia and eventually the Carolinas and elsewhere, right? Who's that first labor force? Ventured servants, not slaves yet, right? And ventured servants are what kind of people? Where are they from? low classes of Europe, right? So the first labor force that comes over are, are white Europeans, right? Um, and how are they treated? What, what kind of lives do they have? Well, well they are. Does anybody know what? 
It's, it's very similar. Does anybody know what an indentured servant actually is, what a term of indenture is? You sign a contract of indenture, which is generally about seven years, but within that period, the, the person who essentially owns you, uh, the farm owner, the planter, uh, can add to that. Well, first of all, most people don't make it seven years. Most people die before that. There's a wicked mor mortality rate, with disease, and people aren't used to the, the climates and things like that. So a lot of folks, the vast majority, not the vast majority, the vast majority never get freed. I don't know how many people die, but it's a significant mortality rate. In addition to that, what they can do is keep adding to your term. So by the end of the, the, the indenture, only about 5% of indentures ever actually, they're supposed to get free and get land. That rarely happens. Like 95% don't pay the remaining indentures or, they, uh, or they'll die. Um, in fact, indentured servants are going to be the reason for one of the first uprisings we talk about being the first rising up for a lot to do with indentures. So in a lot of these colonies, then you start to have these white Europeans come over under contract of indenture. They're lively, they're, they're lives, their daily lives really lined up. That dissimilar to slaves, in that they're actually, in many places, especially in farms, slaves and indentures live together. They work together. They live the exact same kinds of lives. There's a great deal of uh, um, fraternalization between them. You have a lot of marriages. You have children, a lot of mixed-race children. Uh, between slaves and indentures, so that's not unusual. The first slaves come over uh, uh, just a bit later, and to some degree, one of the reasons that slavery becomes so popular uh, is that, that uh, indentures become less reliable. They start to cause too much trouble. Basically, they're not, they're not obedient enough. The first slaves come over in 1619. Um, there's an economic basis for that. Um, you need labor. Um, Slavery predates the United States, obviously, predates North America. Um, actually, the word slave comes from Slav. Slavery had no racial identity. In, in North America, slavery was African-oriented. It came, slaves came from Africa. You have slaves elsewhere from Asia, from South Asia, from, uh, you can have slaves in Latin America. Slavery knows no ethnicity or, or religion or any kind of identity. So uh, in North America, slavery emerged out of Africa because the Dutch and the British and all these other major powers were deeply involved in Africa and they had made alliances with certain <coughs> African states who would then capture other Africans and sell them into slavery. And so you have this massive uh, system. Slavery is also kind of, uh, at, at the beginning, one of the linchpins of a pre-capitalist system at times, you're going to probably think, oh my god, I signed up for econ class. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. What I'm talking about here isn't capitalism yet. This is merchant, it's a merchant capitalist system or a mercantilist system. And under this mercantilist system, states exist to enrich themselves at the expense of others. And one way to do that is to acquire colonies, which is why North America settles, I'm sorry, why Britain settles North America. And in doing this, you send over these people, like the people that go to Virginia, who, who establish these, these plantations. So um, these protests then, uh, and, and this is going to be a key theme, these protests then are going to have often two targets. One is going to be the people who are oppressing them immediately, the planter, the boss, whoever. The other is often going to be until the 1770s, the crown. All right. So um, it's kind of a complex social system. But this labor force is in place from the start. So from the early, you know, Jamestown settled 1607, and by 1619, you have both indentures and slaves in Virginia, and they are producing uh, ins incredible amounts of tobacco. By the, the 17, I'm sorry, by the, the 1640s, um, you're looking at well uh, uh, over uh, a million pounds of tobacco a year, much of it being shipped back to the kind of uh, higher it, it's tobacco smoking starts out as kind of a, a, an affectation of the wealthy and well-to-do. So the tobacco is often going back to, uh, to London. So you have, what, what's this sound like, right? You have poor people making a, a luxury item for the wealthy elsewhere, right? What's that sound like? That's sweatshops today, right? It's, it's very similar. So these labor conditions that we see today are really, in many cases, been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is also when you start to see the beginnings, like I said, of a capitalist system, a, a merchant capitalist system, but not yet. 
All right? This is also going to lead to the first the first protest movement. How many of you have heard of Bacon for Bacon? What do you know about Bacon for Bacon? Nathaniel Bacon, where did it occur? Where did it occur? Well, Virginia at the time. Yeah, Bill was in West Virginia until the 1860s. So it's in Virginia. Um, Virginia is a British colony, just like all the other colonies. The governor of Virginia is a guy named Berkeley. And um, there are different social groups in Virginia, right? So you have the white planters, the people like Berkeley who are in charge of everything, right? They're the wealthy planters, the ruling class. The planters in Virginia, now keep in mind too, when I talk about this elite or this ruling class, it's not just people who run the state or run the colony. They're, they're the, the, the same people who run the colony are the same people who have all the, the, the economic power. So we're not really gonna differentiate between economic and political groups or economic and political power because they're the same. So in Virginia, the people who come over and establish these big plantations also uh, run and, and, and have seats in the legislature. They're judges, they control the courts. Um, they run every aspect of, of uh, life in Virginia. So they control the economy, they control the governor's house, they control the legislature, they control the courts. Um, you know, if you want cable, you have to go to them. DMV, everything, right? So, uh, uh, and, and it's a fairly small group. And you're gonna see this all the way up through the Civil War. In the South, the number of people who actually have wealth and power is always gonna be so tiny, so tiny. And, and most white people in the South aren't gonna have access to power or wealth either. So you have a very small elite. And so the, the, the issue, I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's complex, especially when you deal with something like slavery. Slavery is very easy to see, and it obviously is a black-white issue, right? But within that, it, it, there's there's also this kind of issue of labor, and there are going to be slave uprisings, and we'll talk about them briefly. Um, and, 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 and you have to kind of see these within those two contexts, so you can't just look at everything kind of in, in, a, in a linear way, right? So in Virginia, then, you have the white planter elite, you have white indentured servants, you have slaves, and then what's the other group we haven't mentioned yet, but they've already been there. Who's already in Virginia? Indians, right, uh, who obviously predate the, um, the Europeans. Uh, Indians are important in, in a, because they do purchase some goods uh, from the, um, the, the colonial elite, but more importantly, the Indians are traders, especially in things like furs, right, deer skins and beaver and things like that. So the governor, Berkeley, actually is on pretty good terms with the Indians of Virginia through trading and so forth. Um, Indians tend to live in the ex exterior, in the, in the kind of western parts of the state, not in the cities, obviously. And most of the elite, when they come to the colonies, what part, of, what part do they settle, generally? <coughs> when these people come over, they settle what part? <coughs> the coast. The coast, the coast all right? So they're in the eastern part, on the eastern seaboard, right? Others are, tend to be more in the, you know, kind of not in the exterior, I'm sorry, in the interior. So you have Indians and white farmers are often out there, too. White farmers and Indians, when they get close to each other, what's generally likely to happen? What's going to happen? Conflict over land. All right. When this happens, all right, who does Berkeley support? Who does Berkeley defend? No. He defends the Indians because he's trading with them. These aren't wealthy white people. These are white farmers. These are kind of people who would be called poor white trash. And remember, names like poor white trash and cracker and redneck, those were invented by white Southern elite to talk about poor whites, so the kind of Beverly Hillbilly type people, you know, were, were actually derided, insulted by people from the top down. So Berkeley actually supports and takes sides with the Indians. Um, Nathaniel Bacon was a, uh, a, a smallish landholder, I believe, who wanted um, uh, some kind of commission in the state, he wanted to become some kind of uh, officer of the state. And Berkeley wouldn't give it to him. So who does Bacon go to to rally support? He goes to the indentures and the slaves together. So what you have is a, is a, is a movement that crosses racial lines based on class. So Bacon actually uh, takes up arms against the state. Uh, there is a physical violent confrontation. Now, a lot of textbooks used to say this was a sneak preview for this, for the uh, American War for Independence. Um, 
yeah, no. I mean, there's a, there's a strong class. Of, there's an anti-British element to it in that Bacon and his group oppose Berkeley and the British administration, the British, British administrators in Virginia. But it's actually a, 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 a very radical class-oriented movement because who, does, who, who is on Bacon's, who's in Bacon's group, who's in Bacon's army? Slaves and indentures and poor white farmers against the state, the militia, which is paid for by the state, and then the Indians, all right? So this is kind of, this is what I mean, you know, it, it, the, 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 yeah, Tom? So black and white slaves and white farmers? Black slaves and white indentures, yeah, absolutely. They're on the same side, right? And, um, you know, when the war for independence comes, the British are actually going to reach out to slaves and offer them freedom if they join the, the British against the American colonists in, in the 1770s, too. So, I mean, there's this, the, the, the point here is that there's this texture of class politics, of class and power that, that takes over. Um, and to look at this as kind of, you know, the Americans versus the British, which is the way high school and, well, all kinds of textbooks have always thought it is, is actually incorrect and it's incomplete. So it's much more complex than that. So uh, the point here is that people see themselves as a class, they act as a class, they have a consciousness, and they're willing to take up even arms in this case. Um, we hear a lot today about how everyone is kind of wanting to start, you know, we have this narrative, this linear narrative, everything works out. And as part of that, we have this idea that everybody's kind of middle class, everybody's doing well. It's kind of a lottery system, you know. Even if you're not doing well, you're one, you know, you're one step away from winning the lottery and you already have the money spent, you know what you're going to do with it, all right? Well, in fact, again, that's not the case because people always understood they were part of a class. You have this class system from the beginning in the United States. Now, class... You know, I don't want to start talking theory or anything. In a sense, class emerges with capitalism. And, and so, and that's generally based on industrialization. But, but there are clearly distinct classes or castes, and there's no question about that. And what I think is even more important is people recognize that. If you're an indentured servant, you don't need to read some book of theory to know that you're different and you don't have the same opportunities and the same wealth. Your lives are distinctly different from the people who, who own the the farm or the overseers, the people who run the farm, right? You, you know, so there's a clear understanding. And in Bacon's Rebellion, you see that people acted as a class. They knew they were a class. The indentures did, the slaves did, the farmers in the western part of the state uh, did. And, and clearly Berkeley and the people who paid for it uh, and the militia. And now, of course, what's the irony of that? What kind of people are in the militia? Is it a bunch of rich dandies, you know, a bunch of rich gentlemen who take off their morning coats and off a, a military uniform and they go out there. What kind of people are in the, in the militia? Hmm? Working, they're, they're poor people, right? Yet, who are they fighting against? The same people, right? So what the state is able to do is to get people from that particular social class and give them a different position, right? This is something, I mean, this is, this is a big issue today if you follow the Occupy movement, how to deal with police. Right? If your slogan is, we are the 99%, then cops are part of that 99%, right? But what are the police there to do? Are they there to help the protesters? What are they there to do? They're there to pepper spray them, right? <laughs> That's what I should do. If you guys get out of hand, I'm getting some pepper spray, all right? Uh, it's like Walmart on Black Friday, right? Um, <laughs> which could be the new protest move of the 21st century, right? Uh, uh, cheap consumerism. <coughs> but... Um, so what you have then is this kind of complex system. People understand their place in it. They don't need to be told. You don't need to be told, you know, you're a slave, you're below me, you're indentured, you're never going to be free, uh, you're poor white trash, go back to, you know, to, you know, talk to Jed Clampett or whatever. You don't need to be told that, you know it. And people act that way. And that's really important in the United States. There has always been this consciousness. There have always been people who struggle against it. Now, have they won? We'll, we'll get to that, all right? So, so Bacon's Rebellion kind of sets the stage then, and it kind of creates this idea that there is struggle. Uh, at the same time this is going on, I mean, there are clearly a lot of uh, so-called Indian wars. I don't like that phrase, Indian wars, because it kind of implies a war implies like armies and people of equal strength, and these are really kind of Indian massacres. But you see that going on as well. Now, when I was putting this together, I, I kind of debated whether, how much or whether even I would talk about things like slave uprisings and Indian wars. Or Indian conflicts, because these these are anti-state movements, but they're not exactly politicized. I mean, you know, 
slaves come over, they're, they're kidnapped, for, for God's sakes. They're, they're taken against their will. They're put in these oppressive conditions. So you do have slave uprisings. Indian wars, people are stealing their land. And it's not like India has presented a radical alternative, not really a class-based system or anything like that. But there's clearly conflict going on. I mean, the Pequot Wars, if anyone ever heard of the Pequot Wars, Connecticut and Rhode Island, I mean, it was brutal. The, the, the Puritans wanted this land. It's, it would be like Connecticut and Rhode Island today. And they just simply went in and slaughtered all the Pequot. And they purposely waited till the Pequot men were away from their village. And they went in and slaughtered the women and children. And they boasted about it. Uh, William Bradford, the governor in the history of the Plymouth Plantation, talks about you know how uh, they were they were frying in the fire and the blood of the ones that they had stabbed was putting the fire out and he's boasting about it right now if somebody today did that if somebody today went into a village and killed all the children and the women what would we call that person or what would, what would be the phrase of the day though I mean, what would we call that person a you know, what do you do when you kill innocent civilians you're a terrorist right yeah so there are these terror tactics which are being used by the elite right um, does, I mean, does, and, and that's just something to think about. Does simply standing up to the ruling class make this a radical movement? Does this create kind of a radical protest movement? I mean, if, if the Indians reject this seizure of land, does that make them kind of this protest group? Do slaves who rebel or, or try to escape and leave, run away, have a number, Nat Turner, is that, is that kind of political radicalism? Or is it kind of depoliticized? It's obviously political, but, but, but that's something we're, we're going to have to talk about, too. So Bingham's Rebellion is occurring around the same time these Native American movements, these, these uprisings like the Pequot War and things are occurring, too. But Bacon is really the first large-scale action you see that takes on these particular characteristics. It's, it's class-based. Um, there's a group of people, and this is going to be real important. Uh, in, in the U.S., um, you don't often see these movements which cross racial and ethnic lines. Like one of the best known movements, probably I would argue that the strongest, uh, you know, it's not there yet, uh, is the populist. You've all heard of the populist. One of the strengths of the populist when they got started was it was a, a, a cross-racial movement, black and white farmers together. The populist ditched black farmers and, and you know, it became just a, a whites only uh, movement. So what you see in Bacon is, is actually quite different. You see this in a lot of these <clears throat> um, uprisings. One of the one of the things that's striking is um, racial politics actually is essentially created in the United States. There's nothing in people's DNA that said, you know, we're black, you know, I'm black, you're white. We can't work together. I'm white, you're black. We can't work together. And in fact, like I said, on, on a lot of these farms, um, indentures and slaves worked in the exact same conditions. You know, based on their daily lives, there was no way that you could tell them apart, right? The, the way they actually lived. So because of that, then, you have significant levels of, of interaction. You have people marrying, people having children, and so forth. Um, and that actually scares the hell out of the, the colonial elite. Because, you know, in terms of sheer numbers, you know, if you take all the planters, uh, I'm sorry, all the, all the slaves and all the indentures, and you add them all together, they overwhelmingly have more than the planter elite, the white elite. And so the states, the colonies, I'm sorry, begin to create laws uh, in order to, to separate people. They essentially invent racism as a way to keep people separated because racism is the, is the kind of cure for class solidarity. I mean, if, if you, you all have more in common with each other than you do with, you know, zillionaires, right? So if I'm an oppressive professor, you could all join together, right, and get rid of me, you know, have a coup, throw me out and bring in, I don't know, whoever. But if I can separate you somehow, and, and take one group and give you a favored status, then that changes everything, and that's what happens in the colony. So racism becomes a way to do this. So uh, um, certain blacks are, are used to go chase down the Indians, right? They're put in the army, the militia, to chase down the Indians. Certain Indians are paid by the state to return runaway slaves. Slaves who ran away tried to make it to Indian country. There was this, this, this natural sympathy, you know, against white supremacy. Um, whites especially were told, you're better so we're going to take care of you. There's a great Bob Dylan song, only a pawn in their hand. Anybody Dylan fan in here? We'll listen to some Dylan at the end. Probably play this, actually. I know you are. Um, but uh, it's about the death of Medgar Evers. And the, the great line Dylan says, the, the South politician preaches to the poor white man, you got more than the blacks, don't complain. You're better than him, but you were born with white skin, they explain. It's brilliant because Dylan shows how 
they're using essentially race as a wedge to contain, to continue to have power, not just over blacks, but over poor whites too. I mean, Southern elite don't care about poor whites. They're viciously racist against blacks, but it's not like they like poor whites either, but they use them. And that's what happens in the colonies. And Bacon really is a reason. Bacon scares the hell out of the colonial elite because they see indentures and slaves and white farmers all working together on the same side because they had one thing in common, which was this kind of lack of power and wealth and access to power and wealth. And if that continues, this whole experiment is really up for grabs in the colonies. You know, you need more than anything else, you need obedience. And everybody who writes about that, including people who are kind of part of the great liberal pantheon of founders, understood that if you read John Adams, Thomas Paine, Jefferson, all of these folks were very clear that um, uh, democracy was something to be feared. The people should be, that you had to be careful. The people were passionate. They didn't think well. I mean, it was kind of even the stereotype that a lot of these guys would have of women. Women are passionate, they're irrational, they don't think well. Basically, that was projected on all workers. Workers were often called mechanics, not necessarily because they were mechanics, because they worked with their hands. So the phrase you would often see is mechanics, all right? And mechanics were dangerous because they weren't smart and they acted passionately, emotionally. Uh, and, and so most of the founders feared that that would be the biggest deterrent to creating uh, a major power, an industrial power in the U.S. So above all, you need an obedient workforce. Benjamin Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, all of them were really explicit about this. Democracy is too dangerous, it's too risky, it's unpredictable. You know, people, you know, uh, uh, will get big ideas in their head. We need obedience, we need a deferential, obedient workforce. And the United States, more than most places, I think has had that history. One of the questions that I hope we can play with is why has there never been any real radicalism in the US? You know, we've never had a socialist party, it really had any meaning, there was no labor party. Labor unions in the US have always been fairly docile. I mean, if you know anything about European history, you have socialist parties, you have labor parties, you have national strikes, the whole country will shut down for a day, right? Um, you don't have much of that here. Why? 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 What is it about U.S. politics, U.S. history that, that works against that, the kind of stuff that you see in a lot of other places? Because you don't have that history here in the United States, right? And I think a lot of it has to do with this, this idea that um, um, the, the colonial elite understood that we have to keep folks separated. In addition to that, the US you know, is a really very new country and it doesn't go through the same histories. I mean, Europe has, has struggles all the time. They have the plague and after that, the feudal system falls apart. People are fighting for land. Um, people are fighting for the vote, you know, that kind of thing. That doesn't really happen in the United States. You know, it does occasionally, we'll talk about that. So in the aftermath of Bacon's Rebellion then, there's this real fear among the colonial elite that we can't let this happen again. So we have to stop the people. So the major political issue isn't what are we going to do about the British? It's how are we going to stop the rabble, all right? And in fact, um, uh, to get to that point, there's one of the one of the a historian in the early 20th century wrote a book, um, and and really kind of created this really nice way of looking at this period. He said there were two questions going on, all right. Um, one is home rule. Anybody know what that phrase means? Home rule. Home rule. They wanted America to be sovereign, not, right. not rely okay. on. Anything. So home rule rose with this question of sovereignty and independence, right? Yeah. So there's a question: Who's going to be in charge? Are we going to be in charge of our own country, or are the British? Are we going to remain a British colony? That's home rule. The other, and everybody knows about that, right? Everybody knows about that, right? The other question, though, which most people don't know about, is who should rule at home? So there's two things going on at the same time: home rule and who should rule at home, right? Now, who should rule at home then speaks to what? What group of people will have power here, okay? The colonial elite was more concerned with that question, who should rule at home, than it was with regard to the British. In fact, the colonial elite is British until well into the, the 18th century, right? So the real question then, the social question is gonna be who should rule at home? What are we gonna do with the social system? The economy's booming, we're getting more slaves and more indentures. Until the mid 17th century, there were still as many or more indentures than there were slaves. The move to slavery, the big, huge shift to slavery doesn't occur until really late in the 1700s. And to a large degree, it's because the indentures are less and less reliable. Why 
like Baker's Rebellion is a good example of that, right? What advantages do uh, indentures have over slaves in terms of being able to, to protest and being able to kind of go in different directions? They're more familiar with the culture. They're more familiar with the culture. They look, they can fit in, they look similar, they speak the same language, okay? What else? What's that? They, they have more legal rights, yeah. I mean, being an indentured, you are limited, but yeah, you, you have the ability to work within the system far more than slaves do. I mean, and some of it's just simple stuff. You know your way around. You can escape. You know, you have people you can escape to. You can fit in. You know, if you're an indentured servant and you go to Richmond, you can fit in. If you're a slave and you go to Richmond, eh, you know. Keep thinking of that scene with uh, Cleveland Little and Blazing Saddles, right? Just on the KKK outfit. Okay, there was <laughs> kind of hard to fit in, right? So, um, yeah. So indentures, uh, uh, at the end, are not nearly as reliable to the planners, whereas slaves, not necessarily reliable. They're just much easier to control. So uh, uh, this is when you finally start to see uh, a big shift from indentured servants to slaves. Uh, but that's all part of that larger question: Who should rule at home? And that's, I think that's still going on. I mean, that's the point of Occupy Wall Street, right? Who should rule at home? Should it be the banks or should it be, you know, the people, right? Um, you start to see this question become a lot more intense than in, um, in the 1700s, especially as the conflict with Britain uh, starts to, to really pop up. Um, from the 1670s onward, the colonies and the British crown had a fairly decent working relationship. The British in the late 1600s passed uh, uh, something called the Navigation Acts. Anybody heard of the Navigation Acts? I don't want to spend too much time on stuff like this. There was a, a mercantilist system, mercantilism. Uh, um, anybody know what mercantilism is? I make a stupid joke about merchants, but I better not. No. Mercantilism. It's a system in which um, big powers um, want to expand their power. How do you do that? You acquire colonies. Why do you acquire colonies? You acquire colonies because from a colony you can get, above all, resources, raw materials. You can find a market that you can use to sell your manufactured goods to. You can get cheap labor, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, and you control that system. It's a closed system, right? The British take over North America, right? The Spanish have initially taken over what today would be, what we call Latin America. But the British, we'll, we'll focus on the British, obviously. The British take over North America. Can anybody else get into North America? Can anybody else trade with the colonies? Can anybody else set up businesses in North America? Can any other country? No. It's a closed system, right? I'm the British crown. I control North America. I have it. Nobody else is allowed in. It's mine. I own it. That's mercantilism. It's not an open system. It's not a free trade system. It's, it's a different kind of empire, right? I need to control you because it will increase my wealth vis-a-vis -vis the Spanish or the French, and they're doing this in their own parts of the world, too. France has Canada and actually a little bit of, of what will become the United States, right? And in fact, in 1763, at the end of something called the Seven Years' War, the British kicked the French out. Now this unleashes a lot of social issues as well, not just, it has more to, you know, it's not just about the British versus the Americans, this has a lot to do with social issues, right? What it does is it really kind of highlights a lot of the problems that are going on um, inside of American colonial society. And you start to see this uh, around this period, 1750s, 1760s, um, you start to see, uh, much like Baker's Rebellion, more and more people complaining and taking up arms against their own colonial government. So what you do is you see an intensification of class issues, class struggles, class conflicts, and even class violence. All right, a few examples which are very similar to Bacon's Rebellion. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, and, and most of these are very are, are really identical, um, in, in Bacon's Rebellion, the colonial elite was in Eastern Virginia on the seaboard, and then Bacon's followers and the farmers tended to be more in the interior, right? Uh, the Paxtons were farmers in western Pennsylvania. Now, where's the, where's the, head, the headquarters? I mean, the capital of Pennsylvania is where? Where would it have been in colonial times? What's the big city in Pennsylvania? Philadelphia. Philly. 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 Does anybody know where Philly is? Where's Philly in terms of? Coast. 
from the coast, right? And Philly has, uh, Philadelphia is important. It has two major uh, economic roles to play, uh, commerce, trade, of course, and banking. Um, actually, Philly, even before Wall Street, before New York, was kind of the banking center of the United States. So within Philadelphia, then, you have a, a really wealthy elite of people who trade and people who bank. Um, and people who work in those industries tend to do fairly well, but you have a lot of whites, poor whites who are just farmers and they're in the interior. And the further away from the city you live, the more likely you are to encounter what kind of people in the interior? Indians. Indians. And again, Indians and whites don't get along, right? So this is happening. So you have these farmers who are having difficulty simply raising their crops, um, in addition to all the other problems, you have more economic problems, crop failure, things like that, they have to deal with the Indians. So the Paxtons represent this group of farmers in Western Pennsylvania who are having trouble and really living impoverished lives, and they're having trouble especially now with the Indians. So if the Indians are coming after you, what, who are you going to ask? Who are you going to go to? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to go to for help? You go to the governor, the prison control for militia, right? And you say, Governor, these Indians, these savages, they're coming after us. You know, we're, we're, you have to, it's solidarity. We're, we're white people in Pennsylvania, and, and we need your help. What does the governor tell the Paxtons? He's like, eh, right? What does he care? The, the, this is of no economic consequence to people on the coast. These are small farmers, right? So the Paxtons take up, they create kind of a movement, an armed movement. They actually take up arms. And they start to march on Philadelphia. They're going to go march on the colonial leadership, the ruling class in Philadelphia. Wiser heads prevail because they would have gotten slaughtered. But the, the, there are skirmishes. and I mean, there is violence. I'm not sure if anybody's killed in the process. You imagine records. This is in the 1760s. Records are somewhat spotty. But the, the point was you had significant members of this of this working group, this working class, this caste group, this agricultural group, whatever you want to call it, who are protesting against their own government, right? Not the Brit. I mean, it's against the British in so much as these are British appointees, but they're not opposed to them as Brits. They're opposed to them as the elite. You know, it's not like, you know, if, if, if you know, Paxton, I'm Paxton, I'm opposed to you because you won't help me out. You're the elite. You'll take care of your buddies who own the banks, you know, you'll give them bailouts, you'll take care of these big shipping companies, but you won't do anything for these people who need simple protection to create a livelihood, right? That's what the Paxton represents. So once again, this is armed class struggle. Like, this is, this is radicalism. I mean, under any definition, this is a radical group uh, engaging in radical practices, taking up arms against your own government, right? I mean, nowadays, you know, when people even talk about that, tend to be like the militias, you know, the kind of McVeigh and people like that, right? But this was a group of, of people doing it with this class basis, and they understood themselves as such. Again, nobody had to tell them. They acted as a group. And if you look at their rhetoric, I mean, you know, we are mechanics, we are farmers, we work with our hands, uh, and, 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 you know, we, you know, and, and they'll describe the commercial elite as such. You know, these are wealthy people. They don't have the same interests as us. I mean, they do all but say, you know, we're the 99%, they're the 1%. But that's essentially what they're doing or what they're saying. All right? So uh, the Paxtons is a good example of that. This occurs in Pennsylvania. Similarly, there's a movement going on. And these occur everywhere. I'm just using, I'm using these three examples because they're fairly well known and they tend to be pretty large and there's better documentation on them. Who knows? I suspect stuff like this is probably going on everywhere pretty much every day. The Paxtons become a big army. On a smaller level, I suspect people are, you know, if, if, if you look at things like people trying to petition the courts or people going to the legislature asking for help, I mean, that's occurring every day. Um, you also have at the time debtors' prisons, remember? So people in debt can be tossed in prison, right? So a lot of people are simply fighting against that. And in fact, in New York, that's one of the problems. Um, New York was initially settled not by the British, but by the Dutch. And the British took it over. Um, New York's uh, a big state, but uh, the land in New York was given to 30 different families by the governor. There were land grants, so you have about 30 families, a very small group of people who own pretty much most of the land in New York, right? So 
Um, who's going to work that land? Indenture slaves, and, and not slaves, but to the North tenants. So a lot of people need jobs, so they rent land. Right? So you go and you rent land. Well, this is always going to be a problem because um, oftentimes you can't make enough from um, what you produce to pay your rents. That's very common for all the typical reasons. You have weather problems, you have market problems, and most people are just subsistence farmers too. It's not like they're really um, producing goods for a market. I mean, if I'm a farmer, I'm essentially going to grow what I need from my family. If there's some left over, I can go down to you know the Heights on Saturday morning and sell it to all the liberals and next to the you know uh, tie dye and the jewelry. But um, for the most part, uh, I'm going to like whatever whatever I produce is is, is for subsistence. Um, and so there's not a lot left over in order to make money to pay your rents. And so you'll have the whole family. That's the other thing, too, is this idea that, you know, of women working, women didn't work. Women always worked. Women took in laundry. Women took in borders. Women babysat. Uh, kids worked. I mean, if Newt Gingrich has his way, they'll start working again, <laughs> right? Um, children, children worked. Uh, it's not an industrial area yet, but, I mean, kids worked. I mean, everybody chips in to make whatever they can in order to simply pay rents and buy food and things like that, right? So um, now the people who own the land then, who are the landlords, also control what? What do you think? Not, they not just own all the land, but what else do they do in New York? What's that? The government. They control the government as well, right? So they're... They're, they're in the legislature, they're in the courts, and everything. It's the same people. Same thing with Virginia. It's same thing all over. You know, Virginia, um, you ever hear the birds in Virginia, BYRD, the birds? It's like one of the most famous families of Virginia history. They, they helped settle Virginia in 1607. From 1607 until the late 20th century, there was a bird, at least one bird, in the Virginia legislature or in Congress or whatever. I mean, we're talking about a fairly small group of people who come in and settle. This is the ultimate in old money, right? And so you have that in New York. Well, so if you're in debt or you want to somehow file a grievance against your landlord, um, you can raise rents. Anytime I want, I can raise rents. And if you're not paying, what do I do? If you're in debt, what do I do? I, I own the court. Is that? I can, put, I can go, yeah, I mean, I can start taking your stuff away from you. I can send a repo man after you. That kind of thing, right? So there's really not much redress of grievances. So it's really a, a, a you, you have the, the prisons are filling up now, and so what the tenants of New York, and, and it's kind of a, it's decentralized. It's not like the Paxtons. You can okay, these are a bunch of guys who are getting arms, and the Paxtons are leaving them. It's a little different with these tenant rebellions in New York. They tend to be more decentralized, and that's another. If you're ever into kind of like the theory of of how to organize and protest, and tomorrow uh, my friend Scott might talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's, that's another question to ask. Are, are these protest movements or radical movements decentralized or centralized? I mean, like in Paxton's or Bacon, you have an identifiable group, Bacon's people, Paxton's, the Paxton boys. The tenants is more decentralized. What you have on a consistent basis is groups of people who are organizing collectively because they're in the same boat. They're friends, they, they live near each other, they work with each other. So what you start to see is that these tenants will go to the local jailhouse Right, and these are kind of flimsy jails. And what they'll do is just simply grab, beat up, tar and feather, whatever the jailer, and they'll release everybody. And they won't just release their friends who are there for debt. They'll release everybody in the whole prison. Right, so everybody storms out. And this starts occurring fairly frequently, where you'll have these these you know boom, you'll hit people up, uh, 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 and you'll go to these um, these prisons and you'll release everybody. Uh, the people who do these protests often refer to, to um, kind of revolutionary, it's not the term they use, I can't remember precisely the term, but essentially what they're saying is this is an issue of revolutionary morality, and they often talk about a moral economy too, right? So to them, the fact that you have a contract to pay rent, right, and all of us have done that at some point, we all have contracts to pay rent, isn't as important as the kind of moral issue of having uh, a livelihood. So if that landlord is charging you exorbitant rates or putting you in debt or controls the state, then you have a right, a moral right, to challenge that, to not pay your rents, or to even go to uh, um, the, the jailhouse and free everybody, to go to the courts. 
judges are tarred and feathered, officers of the courts are run out of town. Uh, I mean, it gets ugly, it gets violent. Uh, these are people who uh, travel, you know, I mean, you know, if you're an officer of the court, if you're a judge or a jailer, I mean, you probably want, you know, Chrissy and Polly with you when you're, when you're going out because you're, you're a marked guy. They'll tar and feather you, they'll beat you up, they'll run you out of town. I mean, it's the kind of stuff that you, you know, you see in like The Sopranos or The Godfather, this is what they're doing. So this is really a class war that's going on. The thing about this too is this occurs over a long period of time, throughout the 1700s. The more burdensome that and tendency become, the more frequently you're gonna see these uprisings, all right? And this occurs on a persistent basis. The 18th, like the 18th century is actually a pretty, pretty aggressive, if not violent, century internally. This is before the war for independence, so what's the issue still? The main issue is who should rule at home. It's not, the, the Americans and the British are still fine, and they will be until the 1760s and 1770s, right? This is about, you know, the, 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 the in this case, the renters versus the landlords, right? Now, probably the biggest of all these movements occurs in South Carolina. Um, and, and the story is the same. You have the, the elite, uh, actually it's the Carolinas, it's before they split up. You have the elite, which lives on the coast, and you have a bunch of farmers in the interior. Uh, farmers are often in debt, okay? Well, the other thing, and this happens in New York too. If you are deeply in debt and eventually get to the point where you can't pay your rent, so you can't make the note, what will happen? You own land, you can't pay the note on it. What's going to happen? Hmm? They're going to seize the land, right? And what are they going to do with that land? They're going to basically, they're going to sell it at such a cheap price. Who are they going to sell it to? Just to anybody? They're going to give you land? They're going to give you land? If I'm, if I'm, the, if I'm one of the, the rich land, if I'm one of the 30 big families in New York that controls everything, right? And I sell land and you guys can't pay it. I take your land back. What am I going to do with that land? I'm going to sell it to my buddies and what am I going to sell it for? Cheap, right? So this is occurring too. And like in South Carolina, a group of farmers got together and they wanted to regulate the courts. Hence, they call themselves the regulators, right? Um, so the regulators begin doing the kind of stuff that, and, and most of these movements in Bacon too, start out essentially as, as, as uh, Main Street political movements. They sign petitions, they write letters to their congressmen, they, you know, they go to, you know, they have coffee, they go to Starbucks and talk to people, and they get on the internet and organize and all that kind of stuff, right? And generally that fails. So eventually they take to the streets, and that's what happens with the regulators. They go to the courts, they file petitions, they file grievances, they try to get their land back, and of course it doesn't matter because who controls, I mean, in all these states it's the same thing, the people who control the land. And we're not in a capitalist economy yet. We don't have any factories, we don't have Walmart, we don't have the Gap, we don't have Target, you know. We have farms. It's an agricultural world, overwhelmingly. So it's a land-based economy, and that's why it's not capitalist yet. People who have wealth needs to have land. And so people with land sell and rent land out, right? So not only do they control the land, but they control the courts, political process, the whole thing. It's just happening all over. Every colony is pretty much alike. There's no vestige of democracy. There's actually a fear, if not a hatred, of democracy. You don't want the people making decisions like that. Now, the, the overview, the, the public explanation is, like I said, they're passionate, they're illogical, they're irrational. You can't trust them. Uh, you know, my favorite is, you know, they'll only look out for their own interests, right? That's a bad thing when working people do it, right? Um, so the regulators point that out. We can petition you, but we don't, you know. So what do the regulators do? They put together an army, and they march on the capital. Um, there's actually, this is probably the biggest of all these kind of conflicts. There's actually a pitched battle at a place called Alamance Courthouse, and it's in what would be South Carolina today. Um, each side has over a 1,000 men, armed men, the state militia and the, and the regulators. Um, they come to blows. Uh, a dozen or more are killed in the process. Um, the regulators are beaten back. But this is the one that actually really kind of emerges like Vegas Rebellion. Vegas Rebellion and the regulator, they call it the regulator wars. There's actually, if you're ever in Durham, North Carolina, where Duke is, there's actually a regulated <coughs> bookstore out there, so there's still some kind of sense of it, some memory of it. Um, the regulator uh, uh, war uh, becomes violent, and 
um, kind of, a, I'll give you a spoiler alert, but uh, it's kind of funny. Jump ahead to the War for Independence, where the British are fighting against the Americans. A lot of these people, the Paxtons, the New York Tenants, the Regulators, who do they fight for? What side do they fight on? Take a guess. They fight for the British. Why? They hate the they hate the American elite so much, based on class issues, that they fight for the British. Right? That's how deeply this was imbued. This is this is a, a there's this strong legacy of of that. All right. And this raises that whole issue then, who should rule at home? There's an article in there, it's about New York, and I, you, know, you should read it. But, but this is really a crucial issue, who should rule at home? What kind of society are we going to have? Increasingly, in the same period this is going on, the Paxes, the Tenants, and Regulators, the American-British rivalry intensifies. Um, in 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, the British kicked the French out of North America. The war, however, was really costly. I mean, in, in terms of like, if you would convert it to today's money, it would be many, many, many billions of dollars, right? We know how wars are costly. We're seeing that right now, right, with Afghanistan and Iraq and, and all these other interventions. So the British have to somehow pay for these wars, right? They're deeply in debt. And, and British minds, and they're not really wrong, they fought these wars for the benefit of the Americans. Because what getting rid of the French, what, the French generally were on what would be considered at the time the West, Ohio, Indiana, that's the West, right? The Indians are gone now. What does that mean for Americans? Think about the map. The Indians are gone. Expansion. Expansion. You can move. You know, all right. So who's really benefiting from, from the French and Indian War, from the Seven Years' War? The colonists are, right? But what did they do during the war? I mean, George Washington commanded a unit. But for the most part, what did Americans do during that French war against the British, the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, whatever you want to call it? Uh, they, they kind of sat out, or actually... Traders did quite well because during war you trade with everybody and you boost prices, right? So the British were kind of upset. They're like, you guys didn't do anything and you're benefiting from it. So how does Britain decide to address that issue? Their, their taxes. So you start to institute taxes now. And this is when you have the Tea Act and the Sugar Act and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, the, uh, uh, um, um, where am I going with this thing? <laughs> um, Oh, the taxes themselves are really actually not onerous. Um, most of the taxes basically are established to undercut smugglers. You know the argument like today for decriminalizing marijuana? That's essentially what, what the British are doing. They had maintained this, this from the 1700s on, early 1700s on, what was called salutary neglect. We'll leave the colonists alone because we're making money. But now, 1763, we have these... these Debts because of the war, so we're going to have to make these people chip in, right? It's only fair. So you see the Sugar Act and the Tea Act and the Stamp Act and all this kind of stuff. There's a big difference. These are now what what the colonists said direct taxes, right? And the movement over that, that's going to lead to the war is to a large degree a tax movement. Anybody ever see Dazed and Confused? Uh, Richard Linklater film. Yeah, okay, right. it says so, right? Um, but I don't know if you, if you notice like a, they're in the history class with the kind of the hippie chick professor, the teacher. And it's the last class, and she says something like, you know, and remember this year when you're celebrating the bicentennial, it was a bunch of, about, about a bunch of rich white guys who didn't want to pay their taxes, right? There's actually something to that, right? Um, the, the, the taxes that were levied by the British, in many instances, actually lower the price of major commodities. The Sugar Act, for instance, was, was directed at molasses, which was a major commodity. It was also a drink. You put molasses with rum, and I think they call it grog. I never tasted, but uh, um, um, you, know, you go to the grog bar, you do karaoke at the grog bar, that kind of thing. So, um, um, I believe they were the Rolling Stones got their start at one of those. So. Joking, but a lot of you know the Rolling Stones are they're old. It's a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. Um, so what the, what the Sugar Act actually did was lower, actually lower the price from like six pence a gallon to three pence a gallon. The goal there was to undercut the smugglers. So, in fact, what it does is actually lower the price on major commodities. The most famous, of course, is the Tea Act, right? What's the Tea Act do? The, the, you all know the history behind the Tea Act, right? Just ask, who is it, Michelle Bachman or Kayla, and which one? <laughs> it started in New Hampshire, you know, whatever. Um, no, what did the, what's the Tea Act? Who was it? Was it, it was Bachman who screwed it up, wasn't it? Or Kayla? 
Yeah, it was Palin. Was it Palin? Yeah. So Bachman's the smart, it's like Beavis and Butthead, Bachman's the smart one, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, what's the T active? What does it do, remember? What, okay, what, who's, it, who's, it, who's it applied to? Who, who's the company? Yeah. The, the British East India Tea Company. Britain has a state chartered tea company. And where do they get their tea? From Asia, right? Where do they sell their tea? They sell it everywhere. They can't, the British... East India Company is not doing well. They're in serious financial trouble, and again, smugglers are undercutting a lot of what they do. So what does the what do the British do? Now remember, according to mercantilist theory, the North American colonists can only purchase goods from who? Legally, the British. They have to buy goods from Britain. All right. On the other hand, the East Coast is real big, you know? So it's not hard to smuggle stuff in. The British, and in fact, one of the things that's occurring in this period, in the 1760s and 70s, <clears throat> in addition to these laws, is the British presence is increasing. So they're bringing in customs officials and port officials and things like that, right? And what do you think is happening to a lot of these customs officials and port officials and British officers? Well, they're getting bribed, yeah, absolutely. But the ones who, I mean, just by virtue of wearing that uniform, you're a target. So again, a lot of these people are getting hassled. They're getting, people will go to their houses and, you know, they'll be hanged in effigy. Uh, they'll be tarred and feathered, you know, uh, a few cases the people were actually like, you know, drawn and quartered, that kind of stuff. So, um, again, there's this, this sense, and it's not really necessarily that they're British, it's that they're, you know, they represent, you know, customs or, or, or taxes, they represent taxes. Now, in the real world, the Tea Act actually lowers the price of tea, all right? Why then do people who drink tea in good quantity, why do they protest? I mean, essentially molasses, you know, all these commodities, the price of them is actually either stable or, or decreasing. Yeah, Tom? What? What do you mean? Because the taxes went down. The goal was, they figured if we lower the tax, people will legitimately buy this stuff rather than buy it on the black market, and we'll actually get more tax revenue. That's, I mean, people who argue for decriminalization, isn't that their argument, you know, to a lot of people? legalize it and tax it. That's kind of what the British are doing. We're going to make it easier for you to buy this stuff, right? And now as part of that, they were also going to clamp down on the ports and customs and things like that, crack down on, you know, the black market and things like that. So there would be no duty direct taxes? What's that? So you said there would be no duty the, These, no, these are direct taxes, right? I mean, uh, uh, most taxes before had been um, tariffs. And that was one of the distinctions that people like Ben Franklin made. Tariffs were okay. That's part of the mercantilist system. You know what a tariff is, right? It's a tax on trade, imports, exports. Tariffs were okay, but taxes on goods were not. I mean, the most, the, the most uh, uh, clear repudiation of that was the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act didn't even have any vestiges of trade in it. The Stamp Act was a tax. You had to get stamps for things like newspapers, um, uh, marriage licenses, death certificates, which are kind of the same thing. Um, um, uh, playing cards, you know, magazines, all kinds of stuff like that. So you had to pay extra just for that. And that was, that was really, I mean, that's, you probably had actually, until the Tea Act, the Stamp Act protests were the strongest. And in all of these engender protests, right? But the question is why? Why, why, I mean, if, if, the British laws aren't really damaging you. How do you convince people to go out in the streets and protest or tar and feather a tax collector? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, I mean the, the elite, the the elite sees this as as an issue of power. All right, we don't want the British coming in any longer and making these laws. It's now time for this native-born North American elite to take over. But I have to convince all you people it's in your interest. And this is one thing that's often done. This is where people like Thomas Paine are really important. Because what they do is they create this noble purpose, right? Instead of saying, yeah, you know, the British are, are giving you cheap tea. Well, that doesn't make him sound that bad. I mean, if you look at, you know, look at the rhetoric about King George. He's a tyrant. He's a dictator. Now, you know, if, if you look at tyrants and dictators throughout history, the British don't really fit that model. And I'm not in any way defending imperialism or any of that kind of stuff. The point is, if you look at what the British were doing in the 1760s and 70s, it fit very, very clearly within the parameters of mercantilism 
in no way was it oppressive. I mean, for the most part, you know, there aren't political prisoners, so there are a few. Um, the people <coughs> generally move around freely, you know, uh, they can, you know, it's not North Korea, you know, it's, it's a fairly, it, it's not really different. Um, you know, people, people can do what they want, they can go to work, uh, you know, most of them don't have any feel of, of the British presence, it's just not really there. Yet, the ruling American elite, the Sons of Liberty, Sam Adams, Payne, all those, convince everybody that it's in their interest to oppose this, all right? And so they ennoble it, they say, what they're doing is they're coming after your freedom, coming after your liberty. It's the same writer at the Tea Party people today, right? The anti-Obama, and Obama's a, a Kenyan socialist, right? Kenyan Muslim socialist, I believe. <laughs> so, you know, he's coming after your freedom, right? It's real hard to go to Wall Street and say, Obama's been bad to you. He's the best president of Wall Street you could imagine, right? Um, so what do you do? You have to kind of play up these other issues, and this is what the Sons of Liberty and these groups do. They, they say, the British are trying to take, one word they often use is enslavement. The British are trying to enslave you. How do they use that phrase? What does slavery mean? Taxing you uh, without your consent is slavery. If they tax you, remember, uh, uh, what is it, taxation without representation is tyranny, right? Since there are no Americans who actually sit in Parliament in London, what they're doing is enslaving you. They're taxing you without representation. So that's the same as slavery. Now, of course, the irony there is these people have black slaves, right? They have African slaves. And yet they're complaining that the British are trying to enslave them, right? So, um, and for the most part, I mean, f in, in large measure, this actually works well, all right? So, um, um, you do get these masses out to protest against the British, right? So for a time, that tends to kind of take over. And this is when you get like the Tea Party, uh, where they actually go out and they throw all the tea in the, in the you know, in, in the harbor, right? So you have these people's movements. And for a time, they're directed against Britain. And they succeed. I mean, the average people fight in the war for independence. You notice I haven't called it a revolution yet. That's kind of part of this whole this whole idea. You see, if, if, if it were a revolution, I'd be talking about it a lot more because if it were a revolution, that would mean, I think, that the people actually transform society into power. You don't see anything like that. No new social class comes to power during this war for independence. Uh, the, 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 the colonial elite, which had been British, is replaced by a colonial elite, which is made of born, that's the biggest difference. You replace the kind of British, you know, aristocrats with uh, American born uh, aristocrats. And in fact, throughout the war, um, you see these issues of class power, they don't go away. For a time, they're kind of subsumed under the question of home rule, but the idea of who should rule at home is still there. Um, in, 19, in, 19, in 1779, uh, a Philadelphia artillery uh, unit petitioned the assembly in Pennsylvania about the troubles of the middling and the poor, and they threatened violence. The Philadelphia artillery, uh, a unit in the Continental Army, threatened violence against those who are avariciously intent upon amassing wealth by the destruction of the more virtuous part of the community. During the war against the British, the, 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 the Philadelphia uh, artillery unit uh, threatened class war against the ruling elite of Pennsylvania. This is in 1779, right? Um, um, most of these people uh, uh, um, are very poor. In the United States at the time, only about 10% of the white population had any kind of property um, at all. So um, what you have then is this huge class divide, right? Um, because of that, even in the army, you have a lot of problems with discipline, you have mutinies, uh, soldiers aren't getting paid. So what happens when soldiers don't get paid? They often mutiny. Um, and, and, and while the war is going on, it's not unusual for George Washington or other commanders to have to kind of take a detour from fighting the British to put down a mutiny of their own people, right? And these aren't mutinies based on, I don't want to fight anymore, but they're like, we ain't got paid. You know, I had to leave my farm. My family can't survive anymore. You know, that kind of stuff. So this is, this is really com uh, com common. Um, in fact, uh, somebody who's written on this extensively said, um, the revolution, the war for independence, I prefer to use that word, 
The war for independence plunged the states of Delaware, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and to a much lesser degree, Virginia, <coughs> into divisive civil conflicts that persisted during the entire period of struggle. The Southern, and especially in the South, it was really hard to mobilize Southerners to fight. The war for independence was, the, the, the foot soldiers tended to be far more Northern. And in fact, in the South, you had significant numbers of Southerners who actually sided, continued to side with the British. Some, like the, the regulators, did so because of their animosity, their hatred of the, the colonial uh, elite, right? Um, and a lot of the Southern lower classes actually have a fairly astute class analysis. They're basically saying, look, whether the British win or whether these guys win, it doesn't matter. We're still going to be under their thumbs. It just doesn't matter. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss, right? So a lot of Southerners see that, so they sit it out. Right? We'll just, you know, we'll try to take care of our farms and stay out of the line of fire from Doc, that kind of thing, right? Um, so uh, what they do is they, they, they understand that. And in fact, um, the colonies kind of manifest that. In, in Maryland, for instance, 1776, Maryland Constitution, to run for governor, you had to be worth at least 5,000 pounds, right? Which, you know, today would be, I, mean, I don't know what that I means. That's a significant amount of money, 5,000 pounds in, in 1766. That was a significant amount of money. To run for state senate, 1,000 pounds, all right? That meant that over 90% of the population was excluded from even running for office, right? You also had voting restrictions. At no time, I mean, did more than, let's say, about a third of the people, white men only, course, were they even eligible to vote? So you figure half, about half the population is female, you have significant populations of Indians and blacks, right? Then take out indentures and white men who don't own property, you're dealing with a voting population. A simple voting population is probably less than 10%. It's very small. So in, in, in these particular colonies, every single colony is pretty much the same. Pennsylvania's laws were a little better. Pennsylvania's voting restrictions weren't quite as tight. But in all of these places, uh, decisions are being made and power is being held and the economy is being controlled by a single digit percentage of people in all of these places, right? So um, um, you have uh, mutinies, you have white rioting. Um, in Maryland, the white, there, there are white uh, uh, mechanics who riot against the leading families of Maryland. This is during the war. This is occurring simultaneously. You know? So now what we have going on at the exact same time is the fight over home rule and the fight over who should rule at home, right? Um, there's, there's, there's this fear. The ruling class is always talking about that. They constantly are talking about the, you know, the British and the rabble, the mechanics, the rabble, the mob. They, talk, they call them a mob a lot. You know, uh, the, the language becomes important. You could, you know, uh, uh, it, they're the mob and they riot. You know, you could say uprising. Uprising means something a lot different than riot. You know, a mob means, you know, kind of an unruly group of people, but if you call them something different, you would look at them differently. So, um, it, clearly then the ruling class is very unsettled by what's going on here, too. So when the war ends, victoriously, you have two things to confront now. How to build a new country, but also how to get this, this genie, keep it in the, get it back in the bottle. Because people, in the euphoria of fighting against the British, uh, a lot of them actually said, okay, we want a different society, too. It's not just we want to get rid of the British. We want a different society here at home. And that's going to be the real trick, all right? Why don't we take just like a five-minute break, if anybody wants to go get a drink or something like that, and then we'll come back.